We're looking at the Psalms and we're looking at the beautiful nature of these Psalms. And we last week we looked at what was known as the imprecatory Psalms, a group of Psalms that would call down essentially the righteous judgment of God upon the wicked. Um, very unique set of Psalms. It's, it's something that you notice as you're reading through them and as you go through those and you see some of these incredible uh, statements that are being used and that it seems to contrast with, with, uh, with the things that we would normally think would be there. Today we're having a, a look at what's known as the penitent Psalms, the penitential Psalms. These are Psalms where there is, um, there is repentance. There is a, 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 the psalmist is expressing his, his heart towards the Lord and also regret for, for sin. And, um, and that's something that, um, that the psalmist is, is doing here. Oh, not the pen. Sorry, Maria lent me her pen and I didn't really need it other than a dash. So let's um, let's have a look at um, let's have a look at Psalm Psalm one hundred and thirty Psalm one hundred and thirty, and then we'll ask the Lord to uh, to bless our time. Psalm one hundred and thirty, eight verses there, broken up into four, two verses apiece. It seems to be a, an interesting feature with regards to some of these psalms. Psalm 130. And the psalmist cries to the Lord here and he says, he says this, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do, dear Lord, need to come to you before the word of God with humility in our heart. We know, dear Lord, that we need to bend our knees before you, dear Father. We recognise ourselves in the light of the truth, not in light of how we would prefer to see ourselves. These penitential psalms, dear Lord, are... Uh, a nourishment to our own hearts and to our own souls and they take us to the places that we need to be taken to that we might have a wonderful relationship with the Lord and that we might know you for who you are and the grace and the forgiveness that comes from you. I ask and pray to you, God, you'd be with us, each one of us, this morning as we consider the Psalms and we consider this one in particular. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> One author writes with regards to the entire nature of the Psalms and he says, In these busy days, it would be greatly to the spiritual profit of Christian men if they were more familiar with the book of Psalms, in which they would find a complete armoury for life's battles and a perfect supply for life's needs. Here we have both delight and usefulness, consolation and instruction. For every condition there is a Psalm, suitable and elevating. The book supplies the babe in grace with repentant cries and the perfected saint with triumphant songs. Its breadth of experience stretches from the jaws of hell to the gate of heaven. He who is acquainted with the marches of the psalm country knows that the land floweth with milk and honey and he delights to travel therein. Amen. And that's a wonderful truth with regards to the psalms. They are such a nourishment for the soul. And they lift you up and they glorify God and they give you nourishment for your own heart. It's one of the reasons why the book of Psalms is probably the most quoted book by many people who know the Lord. Because they see within the book of Psalms the heart of all people who would know the Lord. And all people who have a, a cry. The, the experiences are, that are within them are 
are there all the way through and we rejoice in them. Excuse me one second, I've got a... Just one second, sorry. Oh no, it's all good. Okay. There was a connection for the microphone I couldn't see that was in. Here we have the penitential psalms. The penitential psalms number seven. There's seven of them in the scriptures. Psalm 6, Psalm 32, Psalm 38. The wonderful, incredible psalm of David that he has, his repentance psalm, Psalm 51, right in the middle. Psalm 102, Psalm 130 and Psalm 143. Some people also might include Psalm 25 as a penitential psalm. With regards to this particular psalm, Psalm 130, James Vaughan wrote in his book Steps to Heaven in 1878, This psalm, perhaps more than any other, is marked by its mountings, depth, prayer, conviction, light, hope, waiting, watching, longing, confidence, assurance, universal happiness and joy. Just as the barometer marks the rising of the weather, so does this psalm. Sentence by sentence record the progress of the soul and you may test yourself by it as by a rule or measure and ask yourself at each line, have I reached to this? Have I reached to this? And so take your spiritual gauge. And in every way, this psalm does demonstrate that. We see in the beginning part in these first two verses, and I'll title the point Profound Petition. First two verses, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Out of the depths. Out of the depths. I mean, has there been a time in your life where you have been directly in the depths, where there has been such a burden of heart and anxiety of spirit, and it's out of those depths that you cry to the Lord? There are times in our lives where we're going to be finding ourselves in some of the greatest trouble, the greatest fears, the greatest anxieties, the greatest burdens that we find ourselves under in different points of our, of our life. And it's these times, at these times and at these troubles and trials, when sometimes they even come upon us unawares, that we need the Lord and we cry to him directly out of those depths. And, and here the psalmist um, relates directly to us or we to him. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Too many are the depths into which we've often sunk and from which we would cry to the Lord. And they're as varied as there are people who experience them. Everyone has a different experience of being um, overcome and in the depths. And, and, and we see that. These are the sort of depths that Jonah cried out with. And he says, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord and, heard, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. How often has it been the most urgent of our prayers before God when we find ourselves really, really in these depths and we cry to the Lord and we desire the Lord's hand upon our lives. And it's one of these times where we find that it's out of these depths that we draw so near to God because we so desperately need his help. Deep places beget deep devotion, says Spurgeon. Depths of earnestness are stirred by depths of tribulation. And we find this really true in our own lives. There is an earnestness before God when we find ourselves in those depths. We're not, we're not praying anymore from our lips. We're praying from our heart. And we're praying for the deep, from the deepest point of our heart under God. And this is what the psalmist experiences here. And it's the strangest thing as well with regards to this because it's in these times that we have some of the greatest burden before God and the greatest sorrow of heart or the greatest trial and tribulation upon us. And when we draw near to the Lord in this way, 
we find those times also so incredibly precious. We find his love and his comfort seems to envelop us. And, um, and it's an experience that can only be experienced when we are crying out of the depths. These times are precious. They're precious. They're precious both for their value, but also sadly for their rarity. And I do say sadly for their rarity. We should be drawing near to the Lord and crying out of the depths of our own heart on such a regular basis. When we see what we are compared to our holy God, when we see our own shortcomings and our own shortfalls before the Lord. You know, even those who don't know the Lord find themselves on their knees when they are in the depths. Out of the depths they too cry unto the Lord. But those who know the Lord, those times when deep calleth unto deep, seems to be the most precious times of all. You feel as if having the Lord so near, you have need of nothing else. He's your comfort, he's your stay, he's your hope, he's your joy, his rod and his staff, they comfort you. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice, let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. An interesting passage, that one. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. There's indication that the prayer of the penitent man is an audible prayer. Many there be also that take this occasion to consider that the audible prayer takes precedent over the silent. And the reading in this psalm certainly gives that impression that the audible nature is the nature of the deepest of prayers. Personally, I rarely pray in silence. In si- I really pray silently. Uh, there's no question that the more private that I know that I am, the more closeted these supplications of my own are, um, the, more, the more vocal my prayers are before the Lord and the more audible they are. But we need to, get, we need to take a tremendous amount of care here that we don't look at this psalm or this perspective and consider it prescriptive rather than descriptive. And there might even be a challenge that this is even descriptive. Um, Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We'll have a look at verse 11. And many of you are aware of this passage in the Bible. Hannah was in tremendous bitterness of souls when when she was praying to the Lord. One might say with certainty that the text tells us that it was out of the depths that, uh, that she cried unto the Lord. Have a look, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 11. The text there says, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken, and Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. We see something fascinating about Hannah. And we see that she was certainly in the depths. She had burdened and yearned for a son, for a child. And she wanted to dedicate him to the Lord. And here she is. There's no question. She is praying out of the depths. Was it audible? No, it was silent. It was, it was, it was, her prayer was out of the depths. And yet the voice that the Lord evidently heard was silent to men. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Okay, well, there are those also that might consider that a voice needs to be audible to be described as a voice. Well, not necessarily. Turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 4. Exodus, chapter 4. Second book in the Bible, and we see Moses here. Now, the Lord had just revealed himself 
to Moses at the burning bush. And he had recently just given the commandment that he cast down his rod, which became a serpent. The rod became a serpent and now he shows Moses yet another sign. Exodus chapter 4 and have a look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, nor hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of of the latter sign. Signs have a voice that communicate a message. So too even the silent prayer communicates a petition. So we take care with regards to this. When there is a a deeper burden of the heart to pray to God, you pray out of the burden of your heart. And whether it's audible in the ears of men, understand and know that it will be heard by the Lord. It is a voice that will be heard by God. Second point here is a penitent submission. Penitent submission. Have a look at verse 3 and 4 of our text in Psalm 130. Verse 3, If thou, Lord, Shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. Here we have a a demonstration of penitence by the psalmist. Here we've got a demonstration of shame, of repentance, of sorrow, of regret by the psalmist. This penitent man recognises and understands that he cannot stand before God. His iniquities would indeed carry him away if they should be marked. And if they should be marked, he could not ever hope for an acquittal before God. God is, God is the judge of all, and he is the righteous judge of all. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Indeed, who? Who can stand before a holy God? For all our self-glorying and our self-righteousness and all our comparing of ourselves among ourselves, which one of us could truly hope to stand before a holy God if he was to mark our iniquities? When she was caught in adultery and she was brought before the Lord, there was none that were able to, to stand There were none that could stay there. Jesus made it really clear to them. And he said, he that is without sin to be first to cast the stone at her. And yet, and yet from the eldest even unto the last, Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. There were none able to cast a stone at her because all of them were with sin from the eldest to the youngest. If at each moment in our life the Lord Lord should mark every single time we sin, every single time we break his commandments, who is it that will be able to stand? Moses, to whom God spoke directly. It's an interesting thing, you know, because when we're standing before a holy God, we're sort of wondering, even just the, even recognizing who God is, And his holiness should break our own heart. Is it any wonder in the Bible where it says that no man can see my face and live? There's something about the holiness of God that would literally floor every single one of us. Moses was one who stood before God and and, and he asked the Lord, show me thy glory. And the Lord said, all my goodness will, will pass by you. Um, and he and he pressed him into the cleft of the rock and he covered his face with his hands and he said, I will show you my back parts only, but my face no man can see. And we see that. We see that he, he only did that. The Lord, however, when the Lord communicated with Moses, there was a, a heavenly glow that was imparted to Moses and his face shone and it shone so much that not even the people could bear Seeing him, matter of fact, they were filled with fear. They were afraid to come near him and he covered his face with a veil. 
I don't know about you, but my heart breaks when I read the writings of, of, of godly men. <coughs> and I see how they I see how they write. I see their, their heart before God, and, and I can't help but reflect on my own shortcomings. And, uh, and it breaks my heart. It literally drives me into, into the deep. I see how godly they are. I see how much they know the Lord and they love the Lord. And yet even they are brokenhearted with their unworthiness to come before God. As I was going through all of these, some of these Psalms, I'm looking through a set of commentaries by, by, um, by Charles Spurgeon known as, and that's where we get the title of this series, The Treasury of David. And you're aware of that. I mentioned that at the beginning. And the thought came to my mind about the 51st Psalm. What a beautiful Psalm, a Psalm of David. It's a penitent Psalm. It's the one right in the middle of all the penitent Psalms. And, um, and I had a look at what Spurgeon would, would say on it. And I want you to listen and consider how, how Spurgeon feared the Lord and how much more than you and I should be fearing the Lord. Listen to what he writes. He's speaking about the Psalms in general. He's come to the end of it. And he summarizes it this way. He says, In coming upon some of them, I've been overwhelmed with awe and said with Jacob, How dreadful is this place? It is none other than the house of God. Especially was this case with the 51st. I postponed expounding it week after week, feeling more and more my inability for the work. Often I sat down to it and rose up again without having penned a line. It is a bush burning with fire, yet not consumed. And out of it a voice seemed to cry to me, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet. The psalm is very human. Its cries and sobs are of one born of woman. But it is freighted with an inspiration all divine, as if the great father were putting words into the child's mouth. Such a psalm may be wept over, absorbed into the soul. And, ex and exhaled again in devotion, but commented on, Ah, where is he who, having attempted it, can do other than blush at his defeat? Hey, you, you read something like that from these men who recognise that they, they are, when they're opening the word of God and they have to expound the text of the scriptures, that they are dealing with something more precious more perfect, more pure, that has to be handled with such a degree of delicacy that if they knew the holiness of God, they would tremble every time they opened the word of God to pen a single line in commentary on it. And we see that with, with Spurgeon here. We see his heart. And, and yet I look at my heart and I can certainly turn to the book of books so flippantly. Yep, no worries. I'll, I'll expound that one. You start to realise your own shortcomings. You start to realise that if the Lord would mark iniquities, who could stand? There is a tendency in man, however, that is more wicked than we can possibly consider. And I think of it as wicked because and evil and it's to me it's the depths of wickedness in a heart and it's the depths of wickedness that needs to be repented of and it reveals the inside understanding of man with with regards to in order to justify his own sin he he then claims wickedness of god he would charge god with error he would charge god with with sin we have a failure to humble ourselves before God and that's evidenced by a quickness in which we try to ascribe iniquity to God. We look for his shortcomings in order to justify our own. We say in our hearts, if God is good, why did he? So we infer that he is not perfectly good. And this is, this is an evil in the heart that presumes iniquity with God. And what right do we have to do this? I remember doing it before I was saved. I remember shaking my fist at the Lord. It still gives me grief 
to think of, of, of doing something like that. And yet I, I see Christians today in one way or another doing almost the same thing. They, they want to blame God for the sins that they probably put them, themselves in. They want to find a shortcoming with God in order to justify themselves. I mean, what vanity is this? And it grieves me. It grieves my heart so much. Do you desire to pray out of the depths? Then see yourself apart from God. See yourself on your knees crying out of the depths. Because if the Lord should ascribe iniquity, who could stand? If the Lord could mark it, who could stand? Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 verse 10. Solomon wrote, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. In Ecclesiastes 7.20. Clearly presenting to us that there is no one who is just, no one who is righteous, no one who could stand before a holy God. Romans chapter 3. Verse 10, Paul writes and says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And that's probably what sums up those whose iniquities are come to the full. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Job wrote, how should a man be just with God? And he is right. That, that is the overall dilemma of all of mankind. That is the, 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 the peak of the dilemma of all of mankind. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But, notice the but in verse 4, but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. It's the penitent man that finds himself on his knees before a holy God that finds forgiveness with God and that through Christ. When Job asked the question and said, how should a man be just with God? It's fascinating because that same question even comes down through paganism and we see that question even by Aristotle who asked the very same question saying, I know it is, it is, it is for God to forgive sin, but frankly, I I do not see how. We do not see how because we cannot just forgive sin. Sin, like all crimes, has to be paid for. There has to be a penalty ascribed to it because there is a cost associated with them. I know the text says, There is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. Before I came to the Lord, I recall that I, I went to a conference and uh, it was the conference that really, it did, it stood out because it impacted my own heart. There was a, a farmer at the bottom of the stage, and, and, I, and I've recounted this story time and again, I know, but bear with me and be patient. And he, I was up at the stalls, I was right up the back there, and I didn't know the Lord. I, I didn't know the Lord. I was, I was at that point in my life where I was, I was studying a lot more on, on physics. I was reading a lot of books. And, and, and as I'm reading, I came to the realisation that God certainly is. There was no question. By that stage, I'd realised that there is no question in my mind that God exists. Um, and I remembered, and I was sitting there in the dark, and he's there down the front, and he said, all you men up the back there, you think that you're all so tough, yet you're too gutless to walk down here and commit your life to what you know is true about God. Or at least that's what I heard him say. I read in a book somewhere that a man never stands taller than when he is on his knees before God. And that was my challenge. I I saw myself as a man. I saw myself as the one that he was condemning. I'd been already toughened through business and everything like that. I was still relatively young. I wasn't quite 30. 
And yet, I was a sinner in the eyes of God. And I knew this. I knew, already knew that I was. And I needed his forgiveness. The only problem was that I just didn't know how. That was when I heard about Jesus Christ. I knew the name. I'd heard it before, but I never really knew who he really was or why he came. Well, he is God manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. And he came to seek and to save that which is lost, Luke 19.10. And so whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life, John 3.15. Repeated somewhat in John 3.16. God made a way for man that the justice of the law of God would be fulfilled and yet forgiveness would be offered. God's justice was fulfilled in the offering of his son, Jesus Christ, for the sins of mankind. The infinite value of the blood of Christ pays for the sins of all mankind. But only those, only those who desire to be forgiven of sin can Take it. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. But it will not be available to those who don't want it. It's it's the simplest thing in the world. It's the simplest thing in the world. There will be those who want the forgiveness that's offered by Christ through the shedding of his blood. But there will be those who don't want it. Because again, they ascribe Iniquity with God and not within themselves. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. Third point this morning is a patient trust. And that's found in the next two verses, verses 5 and 6. Patient trust. Verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Waiting is that work that is considered the blessed posture of the believer. It's that state that is contrary to our natural desires. It's, it's a complete opposite to what we want to do. Isn't that interesting? <coughs> Excuse me. What we naturally want to do is that all the desires of our heart would be fulfilled immediately. That's what we naturally want to do. When we ask for a thing, its benevolence is measured by its early attainment, not by its value. Do you get that? The goodness of that which we ask for is determined by how quickly we receive it, but not by its value. And we know that. People don't go to McDonald's because the hamburgers are better. But they're not, you know. They don't go to McDonald's. They don't go to Hungry Jack's. They don't go to those places because the hamburgers, the burgers are better. They're not better value than those that you can actually get from a fish and chip shop in Australia. But I can guarantee you if you waited, um, if McDonald's, took just as long as a fish and chip shop to make hamburgers, I don't think they would have come out of the US. You know, Maybe the US would like them. But we don't eat those things because they taste better. We, we taste them because we get them quicker. It's our natural tendency to receive that which we have petitioned for quickly. But that is not the blessed hope of the believer. That is, that is not our, our joy. That is not, that is not what we look for. We, there is a joy in the patient and expecting waiting to see the Lord perform that which we have cried out of the depth. Octavius Winslow says this, he wrote in 1874, Here is the gracious soul hanging in faith upon God in Christ Jesus upon the veracity of God to fulfil his promise, upon the power of God to help him in difficulty, upon the wisdom of God to counsel him in perplexity, upon the omniscience of God to guide him with his eye, upon the omnipresence of God to cheer him with his presence, 
at all times and in all places, his son and shield. We have all heard the expression, good things come to those who wait. Oh, when it comes to that which is expected from God, that good is multiplied many times over for the believer. We wait for the Lord because we trust his words. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. As a child waits patiently for Christmas, you know, and I, and I can remember myself those times at my grandparents' home and I would be so looking forward to Christmas. It was just, I knew it was going to be a wonderful time. There was something special in my mind and in my eyes with regards to that time. There would be presents and there would be family there and we would have the most wonderful time and there was always a strict routine. And yet I looked forward in hope. You know what? And I think you've all experienced it in one way or another. Sometimes it's the hopeful looking forward to that is almost as good, if not even better sometimes, than the attainment of the thing. You know, um, we looked forward to last year going overseas, you know, and it was something that we were expecting and we were looking forward to and we were anticipating it and we were excited about it and it helped us get through our days because we knew that there's coming very closely a time we're going to be getting out of here and going on a holiday overseas and, and it didn't disappoint. It was a blessed time. But I can tell you that that hope and that looking forward to was almost, not quite, but almost as good as the time that we spend overseas. Now, this is going to be measured completely out of proportion. Our hope and our longing for with regards to our Lord is going to be completely out of proportion to what we get. And, uh, and if we knew what we are going to have, if, if there was something in man that an eye had been able to see and an ear had heard what God had prepared for him, we perhaps would be, I don't think there'd be too much about this world that we'd be worried about, to be perfectly honest. In his word do I hope. In his word do I hope. Why do we hope in his word? Because his word is contrast to everything else in this world. His word is true. His word is true. It's absolute. It's true. It's real. It's right. It's there in front of our eyes and every word is placed there for a purpose and it's for the nourishing up of our own hearts. But deception is the rule of the day here in the world. You can't trust your media. You can't trust those who, have, who you elected to govern over you. You can't trust them. You can't trust the integrity of the courts. You can't trust the teachers. You can't trust the medical establishment. In fact, you can no longer completely trust any organisation to be truthful in its words and in its claims. You simply cannot. There is deception upon deception rolling through this world. And why is that? Ah, because there is a prince that governs over this world and he was a liar from the beginning. We cannot expect to find truth within the world. And it doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum that you're on, whether you're on the left or you're on the right, you can't find absolute truth. But in the Word, in the Word of God, in the Bible, and in His Word do I hope. We hope because we know that it's true. And it's in His Word that we wait for the Lord. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. This is a glorious expectation that we have. The, the watchman waits for the morning. The guard stands sentinel, knowing that when the morning comes, that when the morning comes, his time of duty also comes to a close. We are also in just a state as this. We wait for the Lord. We, we look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Any moment, at any time, according to his wonderful promise to keep his church from the hour of temptation that will come upon the world to try them that dwell on the earth in Revelation 3.10. The Lord will come for his church and incredibly, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. The impression that we get with our word twinkling is, is the speed at which light goes directly across the pupil of the eye. That's the twinkling of an eye. That's how quickly we will be changed. This is our waiting. But 
how long, how long have we waited so far? Well, almost 2,000 years so far. Jesus said, surely I come quickly. Amen. How enthusiastically does the Apostle John respond to that second last verse in the Bible, in the entire Bible? How does John, John respond? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Even so what? Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. This is his encouragement. This is his desire. This is what he was looking forward to. He was looking forward to the coming of the Lord. He wasn't looking forward to the trial and the temptation that would come upon the earth. Be careful here. The Lord chastised those that looked forward to the day of the Lord in Amos 5.18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is that to you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. That is more than enough for us to be able to understand that John did not himself desire that coming, but the coming of the blessed and imminent return of Christ for his church beforehand. It's a fool's errand to think that any person would look forward to the day of vengeance and the wrath of God. This is the distorted madness of some people today. The Lord will be coming for his church well before that, that dreadful and notable day of the Lord. John waited, just as Titus did, as Timothy did, as the Thessalonian church did, as the Corinthian church did, as Peter did, as Paul did, and as all the early church waited, so he waited, longing for and looking for, and so we wait. We wait. We wait and we watch. And we watch more than they that watch for the morning. More than they that watch for the morning. So we have waited patiently and expectantly and joyfully each and every day, longing for and loving his appearing. And incredibly, to those who do so, Paul speaks of a crown given to them in 2 Timothy 4.8, those who love his appearing. The petitions that we cry to the Lord out of the depths, we know he hears the voice of our supplications. And because we trust in his word, we wait for the Lord. And we wait more than they that watch for the morning. We just continue to wait and we watch and we look for and we long for and we have hope in. Prize of redemption, the last point this morning. Found in those last two verses, the wonderful prize that's brought together and given. What a joy this is that they receive. Verse 7, let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. There simply is no justification for despondency in the Christian life if his trust is in the Lord. In fact, it's a shame of shames for those who know their Saviour to think for a moment that he is not worthy of their patience and endurance in waiting for the Lord. It is a tremendous shame. We have no right to be despondent. Of all the people in the world, we do not live as if we have no hope. We live waiting for the promise of the Lord. We live because we have hope in his word and we know that his word is true. So there is no cause for despondency. There is no justification for despondency. There is only cause for a joyful looking for that redemption that will come. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, says Peter, but is long suffering to us. Would long suffering to us. Listen to what he says. Not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Why does the Lord delay his coming? Because it's not all just about you, beloved. It's not all just about you. It's about all of those who are yet to know the Lord. He is patient and he is long-suffering. And he is patient and long-suffering because he's not willing that any should perish. He is giving as many people in the world the opportunity to come to him. And it is not going to be until the fullness of the Gentiles become in that he will begin that clock again that was paused at the beginning of the church 2,000 years ago. That timepiece that began at the beginning of the church and will end at its rapture. Then God will again be dealing with the nation of Israel and the world. Everything that was promised with respect to this will still come. 
But this parenthesis in history is there for a reason and it's there that all the fullness of the Gentiles will be coming into the church. And then God will deal with the world. That doesn't mean, of course, that there won't be anybody saved during that time. The Bible indicates that there will be a multitude that can't be even numbered. You know, there's a wonderful structure to this psalm. There's a beautiful structure to it. The first two verses bring out the intensity of the desire through that heartfelt supplication before the Lord. The next two verses are this humble confession and repentance and faith. We consider verses 5 and 6 that speak of the waiting and the watchfulness that those who trust in his words joyfully await. And then there's these last two verses that we have this joyful expectation, this prize of redemption, both for the psalmist and all Israel and everybody who knows the Lord. This is the prize. This is the redemption. This is what we look forward to now. But he is speaking about that which will come. Isaiah writes, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Isaiah 64.4 Paul employs that same saying when he says, But it is written, Eye has not, hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. In 1 Corinthians 2.9 let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The psalmist knows that God is faithful and the psalmist waits patiently for that final redemption that will remove from Israel all his iniquities. And likewise, we wait. We wait also. We wait and we rejoice. Like the child that looks forward to the Christmas with all this wonder and imagination and considers he is sure that it will come and it will be wonderful, we also wait and we rejoice and we look forward to that coming. Why? <laughs> we wait. We wait because Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light and that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. There comes a time when the greatest hope stems from the depths of the greatest need and that is why we cry out of the depths. The greatest need we have is the forgiveness of sin. By far, the greatest need we have is the forgiveness of sin. That our iniquities would be forgiven. That our iniquities would be forgiven. That is the greatest present need. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. It's the cost and merit of a life of sin. But it's the most expensive indulgence of all for the world. The indulgence of sin by the people of the world is by far the most expensive price that they will ever, ever pay for that indulgence. And who can afford it? God will indeed mark iniquities and there is a record of all people for all people and what all people have done and no person will stand. Solomon wrote, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes 12.14 There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known, says Christ in Matthew 10.26. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, we'll finish on this verse. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And the text simply says there, we'll read the first and then the, the next verse, so 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That is the state of all those who have their iniquities marked by the Lord. Recognize it? That is the iniquities of every single individual being marked by the Lord. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That is the point at which there is a recognition that all our iniquities are marked 
by God. So what do we do? How do we live? Then he gives us the answer there in verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Let's have a look at it in context again. Read verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That is the reason Christ came and that is the reason why he died. But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared, the text says. If you are as a penitent man and will put your faith in Christ, whom God hath made as an offering for sin once, you are saved. You are saved. And that is the blessed joy that we have before God. That is the comfort that we have as Christians. The Bible says that those who have placed their faith in Christ have their sins taken as far as the east is from the west. There is no no coming together again of sin within our lives. We have our sin completely purged. We are now clothed, the Bible says, with the righteousness of Christ. Do I understand that? I don't understand that. I don't understand how that works at all. I've got no idea how how that works. But that is the only way for men to be saved. Because if God would mark iniquities, who could stand? There was a cost associated to sin. That cost was paid for by Christ on the cross for all of mankind. Infinite value of blood paying for an infinite number of people's sins. That all may be redeemed, that all may be redeemed, and that redemption will come. The penitent man is by far the most exalted man in the Bible. This is the one who, in abasing himself, the Lord lifts up and exalts. Every single man, woman, and child that would abase themselves, the Lord will lift up, the Lord will exalt. The Lord will bless. Never has a man stood taller than when he is on his knees before the Lord. Let's pray. We give you thanks and praise. We thank you for the word of the living God. We thank you, dear Lord, that it brings to us the light and the hope of Christ and the eternal salvation that we long for and look forward to. We know the day of our redemption is drawing clear and and near, and we pray, dear Lord, that you would continue to bless us with the hope and the looking for of the coming of our Saviour and King. I pray, dear Lord, for those who have heard the scripture this morning, and I ask and pray, dear God, that they would submit themselves before a holy God, that men and women and children and all those who would love to stand would be on their knees before you. I ask and pray, dear God, that you would bless them and encourage them and fill them with your spirit that they would know that they are forgiven. And for those of us, dear Lord, who continue to wait patiently, let us be wonderfully blessed and let us rejoice in the hope and the coming of our Saviour and King. And until that day, dear Lord, we will look in this life with joy and hope that we might have that hope within us that may be evident to all people who ask us also for the hope that is within us. I pray, dear Lord, let us give an answer to them I ask you, dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen.